So now that we have our simulations done and we have imported some data about the laminar flow and turbulent flow into Excel, we're going to post-process that data and compare the profiles between the laminar, laminar and excuse me, between the laminar and turbulent case, and then we're going to compare between the simulated results and some results that we get from uh, analytical or empirical analysis, which were presented in the uh, first lecture. So let's start off by migrating to Excel. And the first thing we're going to do is uh, plot. So we'll go insert chart. And uh, in the context of a scientific chart, OK, let's see, a uh, stacked line with markers. Line with markers, OK. Um, you do not want to use polynomial splines, OK? Uh, that's what I was going to point out, is that you want to select a plot that's going to connect the dots with a straight line. And that's not because we think that the flow is actually following a totally straight line in between. It's just the kind of default way in the context of plotting scientific data that you communicate that you don't know what the value is between those lines. I mean, really, it would be even better to just only plot the dots in some sense, because that would be a more accurate representation of your, your knowledge. But, um, but we use a straight line to connect them so that you can kind of visually observe the trend a little easier. When you connect them with splines, it sort of suggests uh, that you have a sense of the properties in between the dots, which we don't necessarily in this case. Um, and that's not necessarily an inherently bad assumption. And if you're maybe more mathematically inclined, you might be thinking of this in terms of basis functions and saying, well, you know, a linear basis is just as arbitrary as a spline basis. And, you know, that's right, sure, true in some sense, but we're talking about conventions here. So all of that is to say, don't hand in plots with splines, okay? Use straight lines. Uh, all right, so we've got our chart. Now we're going to select data and let's go add. And we want to add uh, first, oh, you know what? I've selected the wrong kind of chart here. So let's try that again. Insert, scatter is what you want. So you want the scatter and then you want this scatter with straight lines and markers. And then right click, select data, add a series, and we'll call this a uh, laminar. For the series X values, you can drag down, click the X values and highlight them, select that Y thing, delete it, and add the Y values, and click OK. We're going to do the same thing for turbulent flow. Named it, added the X values, delete that, and added the data. And we're good. So this is this is the data we want to plot. And what you're seeing here are, is that the turbulent shear stress is higher than the laminar shear stress throughout. And we both have very high shear stress in that first uh, element right at the edge of the wall. And then as we progress, the uh, gradient gets less and less extreme. And the amount of shear stress exchanged between the fluid and the wall is going down. And that's easy to see, right? Because we saw that that boundary layer was growing and growing. At first, there's no boundary layer, and then the boundary layer grows. And that means that the velocity gradient, the velocity right above the wall is much closer to zero as you move far away from the wall. And that boundary layer is much thicker. And so the stress, the viscous forces in the fluid and the stress, uh, the stress between the wall and the fluid is much lower as we go away from the leading edge of the plate. Um, but this plot isn't done. Uh, what we want to do is add some chart elements. And this is a must, uh, again, in science and in engineering, is that you effectively communicate the data that you're trying to share, OK? So we're going to add titles to our axes. And those titles must contain units. And then we are going to add a chart title and 
you know, chart title depends on the context in which you're presenting a figure. For instance, if you're presenting it in a scientific paper or a long, um, a long uh, report, you will probably have a figure caption, and then you wouldn't necessarily need to title a chart and have a figure caption. It's a little bit redundant. Um, but so here we're going to add a title, and then we'll add a legend as well. And this title will be shear stress over a flat plate. And this is the shear stress and key, add the units. Do not forget units. And this is X in meters. So that's shear stress in Pascals. The last thing I wanna do is just uh, click the legend and you've got this format legend option here. If you don't see that, you can just right click, format legend, go to the paint bucket, give it solid fill, make it white. And then if we go over to the legend options, you can uncheck show legend without overlapping chart. And so that allows us to just drag the legend onto the chart and save us some space. And that is our chart for shear stress. I'll just save that. We want to do the same thing for velocity. So let's insert a chart, scatter, straight lines. Is it doing that automatically? Weird. Okay, I don't want it to do it automatically because I'm not sure how it did that. And if it doesn't do it for you, I want to walk through the process of doing the chart again for your benefit. So let's select the data. And in this case, oops, no, okay. So we want to add a series. First is going to be laminar. Uh, and the X data, you can click the first value of X. And then if you have control shift down arrow, it's just going to automatically select all the data. And then we want to go back up to the top. So shift click to the top. And we've got our Y values. And we're going to do again the same thing for turbulence. So, oops. That's all going into the name. That's not necessary. Turbulent X values. I want to go back up to the top. And then we have some Y values. Select all of your data, click OK. And there's our velocity plot. And we're going to do the same things where we add some titles. And you should do this on your assignment. We add some legends. And if you're handing in plots that are ambiguous, it's potentially going to be worth less marks. Okay. You really need to be clear in what you're saying with your plot. You can't just have a plot with some data on it and doesn't it indicate what that data is. It should uh, it should communicate very specifically what information is contained in that plot. Uh, so let's go solid fill. Uncheck. We have uh, X in meters, and this time we have velocity in meters per second. And the chart title should be something like velocity over a flat plate. And the last thing I'll do is I'll select this X axis because the boundary layer, like we described, is very, very thin. So if we uh, click the options, we can go axis options and restrict the range to like, let's say 0.2. And now it allows us to see much more clearly that maybe I'll even go like 0.15 or something. Okay, so now this is a nice depiction of the uh, flow. And, uh, oh, it's, uh, let's make that zero. Okay, so now, now we've got uh, a nice visualization of the boundary layers. One thing you'll notice is that um, the turbulent boundary layer is a lot thicker than the lam laminar boundary layer. And that makes sense because in turbulence, we've got all of this mixing. And so momentum is diffused through the fluid much more quickly. What does not make sense is that the um, the laminar profile 
is, has a much steeper gradient. And so that doesn't make sense kind of intuitively, but it also doesn't make sense with respect to the shear stress, right? Because we're observing higher shear stress in the turbulent case, we should be observing a higher velocity gradient. And we don't see that higher velocity gradient because um, essentially the way that solid, it's there's a lot of material to present in order to fully uh, communicate and appreciate this idea. But the turbulence is three-dimensional and time varying in nature. And what we're getting is an average profile. And one thing that that you do in order to model the turbulence is you take the governing equations and you average them in time. And then you have to account for correlations between fluctuations and you get something called a, um, well, in essence, there's a lot of steps here, but the, the thing that's important to communicate is that you have a wall uh, function that is used in order to describe the velocity profile as you get very, very close to the wall. And it's, it's a modification on the shear stress. And so uh, the way that shear stresses are modeled for turbulent flows is quite different. And we're just not going to get into that in a lot of detail. Um, but this shows you that some phenomenological aspects of that boundary layer were correctly resolved by the simulation. And also we got the correct trends in shear stress. Um, and so I pulled up an image here. This is what we would expect to see. So we would expect that the laminar and turbulent kind of converge to the same free stream velocity, but the turbulent boundary layer is going to be much steeper. Um, the last thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the skin friction coefficient. Oops. So if we go to this new sheet we've created, let's go skin friction. And we can start off by just copying the data from the shear stress. So let's go copy, skin friction, paste. And we can delete this guy actually. Yeah, paste. And we can also get rid of the uh, zero entries because sure stress is gonna go to infinity at zero and you will see in a moment that that would not be something we could model. So, okay. What we're gonna do is we're gonna first calculate the Reynolds number with respect to X. And then we're going to look at the skin friction coefficient from the simulation, as well as the skin friction coefficient uh, from uh, theory. And when I do this, I want to select this text and I want to go control one subscript. And I'm going to do the same thing here. And the same thing to X. And uh, I've got units here. This is uh, shear stress. Can actually put a symbol on that. My Google Tau. So that is a Tau symbol and then wall and the units are Pascals. Good, okay. So let's copy the same thing, paste it here. Now, first thing is Reynolds number. What we're gonna want, oh, and actually the last thing I should do just in terms of cosmetics is merge and center. And we'll have a couple flow properties that we need to track. Let's call this flow and fluid properties. And the first is going to be the kinematic viscosity. Well, maybe I'll use the uh, symbols as well. So kinematic viscosity is new. And that's essentially a V, but I'll just 
copy and paste the Greek letter anyways. And that's meters squared per second. Uh, we will also want the density, so that's going to be rho. That's kilograms per meter cubed. And lastly, we want the free stream velocity. And for that, we want an infinity symbol because I'm just very intent on getting all my symbols here today. So for the last thing, we've got free stream velocity and that is going to be U infinity. And so the infinity, we can make a subscript. Bit of a roundabout way of getting there, but we got there. Uh, so these guys are, oops. We'll make these italic to indicate that we're all right. So uh, kinematic viscosity, we have 1.5 times 10 to the minus five meters squared per second. And for density, we have 1.2 kilograms per meters cubed. Those aren't uh, very exact numbers, but they are the numbers that I'm providing you with in the notes for the sake of this comparison. Ah, somehow this did not, I can't believe I forgot to do that. Uh, okay, there, now it's pretty. And for the velocity, we did 15.24 meters per second, as you will recall. Uh, so the first thing is to calculate Reynolds number, and that's going to be the same equation in both cases. We've got, by now I hope you know, it's going to be free stream velocity multiplied by the position along the plate divided by kinematic viscosity. And you want to take these H cells here, which are the properties that are not changing, and add dollar signs in front of the letter and the number. And that means that when we drag out this equation, it will correctly apply the uh, same cells to each entry of the Reynolds number. Uh, I should have also centered these guys. Everything is more readable when it's nice and organized. So I hope you guys are organizing your Excel charts and data that you're presenting as well. Um, but in any case, that's how we calculate the Reynolds number. And you'll remember that we defined the frictionless coefficient as tau divided by half rho u infinity squared. So we can calculate the skin friction coefficient that the simulation would suggest. And that's going to be, uh, oops, not the Reynolds number, of course. That's going to be tau wall divided by open brackets 0 0.5 times density times free stream velocity squared. Okay, and again, these H guys, we wanna add dollar signs to the number and to the letter. I'm sure you're all quite proficient at Excel, but we'll just go about that here anyway. And for the theory, we had uh, the result, which was from the Blasius solution and plugging it into uh, the, the definition of theta and then taking the derivatives. We didn't go through that, but we kind of gestured towards it in the second uh, part of the first lecture. And we have this final formula that we got, which was that uh, if we take that analytical profile, then the skin friction coefficient should be equal to 0 0.664 uh, divided by the square root of the Reynolds number. And we can do the same thing where we drag that. And so now we have a comparison for laminar, and I'm going to do the same thing for turbulence. So, Reynolds numbers calculated in the same way, free stream velocity multiplied by position divided by kinematic viscosity. And I'll add in my dollar signs.
And now we want to apply that to all of the cells. The simulation-based skin friction coefficient is going to be um, the wall shear stress that, that SOLIDWORKS gave us divided by 0.5 times density times velocity squared. And again, we want to add the dollar signs, the requisite dollar signs to fix the formula. And then we will drag. And lastly, we're going to use a different value for the turbulent skin friction coefficient correlation than we used in the assignment. And that's because this is not analytical, this is empirical. And so we have different functional forms and coefficients that can be used to describe a uh, turbulent uh, skin friction coefficient. And so the one that's appropriate in this context, so we have 0 0.027. Uh, da, 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 so 0 0.027. divided by Reynolds number, and this is gonna to be to the power of one seventh, not one fifth like we discussed in class. Okay, so let's save. And the last thing we're gonna do is we're going to plot this. So let's start off with a plot. Let's select some data. Let's call this uh, simulation. X values will be X values, and Y values will be this simulated skin friction coefficient. And we'll add another one for theory. And then X values are X values, Y values are the theoretical skin friction coefficient. And while I'm preparing my plot elements, I'm just gonna mention that the correspondence here is incredibly good. Um, so this is the, the orange line is derived purely based on, you know, manipulating those equations. And the blue line, uh, I believe, is the blue line simulation. Yeah, the blue line is calculating the full Navier-Stokes equations in that um, domain that we have set up in SOLIDWORKS. And you can see that they line up incredibly well, especially as we go far from the plate. Um, so as the flow has time to develop over that plate, we're getting even closer to the uh, reality, but already we're quite good even at the leading edge of the plate. Although mathematically we get a singularity at the precise leading edge. And so presumably there the numerical solution is going to break down. But uh, so we wanna add a title, and we want to add a legend. And I'm modeling this for you because it is good behavior. You should do this. Do not forget these things. So I'm, and we're going to call this um, uh, theoretical, oh, let's call this laminar skin friction coefficients. And this is the skin friction coefficient. Can I do, oh nice, I can do subscripts here. And that is unitless. And this is X in meters. And I think we should be able to just kind of copy and paste this chart. And then we'll just select a different data range for the turbulent. So you can copy the chart and paste it. And then if you right click your new chart and click select data, we will edit, delete the X and Y values. Okay, it wants Y values first. So Y value will be the simulation guy, X value will be that, okay. And then we want to edit the theory X is unchanged, Y is the theory skin friction. And once again, you can see we get this very beautiful, oops, trying to drag this so that it's further from the data. We get this very beautiful 
correspondence between the values that we predict using empirical correlations and the uh, results from the simulation. And so there are some discrepancies, as you can see. These are really good trends. I mean, it's it's often a lot better than what you see in a research context when you're discovering something new. So it's like lining up very well. There's clearly a, a deep physical connection between those two expressions, uh, or the expressions, I should say, and the simulated results. But what you will do in your homework assignment is you're now going to refine the grid, and then you're going to analyze how the trends uh, between the skin friction coefficient and uh, that's produced by the simulation and the skin friction coefficient produced by theory uh, converge or diverge as we get finer and finer grids. So that's all for the lecture on uh, flow uh, boundary layer flow over a flat plate.